This is a talk, uh, I titled this The Seven Tribes of Real Estate uh, to get you all excited. <laughs> I needed a hook and that was my hook. So um, before I get into it, I just a little quick background. Um, uh, Wells Fargo has got a commitment to sustainability. I'm a member of a team there, uh, the Environmental Initiative Group. Uh, I'm sort of the appraiser guy. There are people who are involved in greening our branches, uh, corporate properties. Uh, the bank uh, lends a lot of money to lead buildings. Uh, we publish a, a report every year that uh, outlines uh, our commitment. Um, I sort of work in, in this area here with green building lending. I'm the principal appraisal manager for uh, the lending the bank does on LEED, Energy Star, solar PV uh, buildings. And, and there are other appraisal managers like me who order appraisals, you know, read them. My day job is to just manage the appraisal assignments for commercial investment real estate. Um, so the question I'm asked more frequently than any other is what is the problem? Why isn't more investment happening? And so this talk is about deconstructing that problem. Uh, you know, I, I get that question from people in all different sectors of real estate. Uh, it's a big bank. <laughs> we do lending on a lot of stuff. And so to, to understand where the problems are, I sort of took this approach where these groups of people that, that cluster around uh, these tribes, and they're really asset classes. And so if you think of these tribes as, as uh, owners, buyers and sellers, you know, acting, behaving in the marketplace, and, and they all have a lot of similarities about their attitudes on risk, their access to capital, uh, their, the cash they've got, and then you know, how they understand this, their particular context, getting a loan, getting an appraiser, and in, you know, getting something going with uh, energy efficiency investing. Uh, you know, they're different. And, and so those differences are what I'm gonna talk about today. And so if you, if you look into those tribes and you deconstruct where those people are actually working, you, you can find the places where you can make a difference. And I'll talk about some examples where I've done that at the bank. So here are the seven tribes, okay? And, and like I said, they're basically asset classes. This is nothing new. I'm really not gonna present any new information here. Uh, at Wells Fargo, and I think in general, appraisers and bankers, the words creative really don't work. Uh, my boss does not wanna hear about creative when I'm working on this stuff. So, so everything I do uh, is extremely mainstream extremely traditional. I'm just trying to deconstruct the problem and look at it a little differently. So single family homes, generally owner occupied. Uh, you know, these are people who aren't very sophisticated. Small commercial real estate. Uh, this is mom and pop, kind of SBA style. Uh, what I call medium uh, commercial investment. CNI is, uh, you know, maybe local credit, local investor groups, uh, larger sized owner users. You know, in this sort of two, five, 12, 15 million dollar range. Uh, then you've got large commercial investment property, you know, Thomas Properties, Heinz, you know, the really big REITs, people who are really sophisticated. Multifamily, uh, including, you know, large, small, market, affordable, uh, special purpose, uh, you know, gas stations, hotels, and then the mush market. So these, these groups, if you, if you can, I mean, thinking about the people who live in those spaces, you realize you know, that their problems, their understanding of energy efficiency investment is completely different. So they're the people who run the market. You know, banks, appraisers, we're, uh, banks are fo follow the market and appraisers are ultimately reporters. You know, we just tell people what the market's telling us. So I gotta tell you, financing is not the problem. It's defining the risk. When Risk is properly defined, the market, money moves there in a very natural way. And, and that's really what, what has to happen, is a better definition of, of risk. And so I'm gonna talk a lot about risk and, and try to break it down. And it's, it's a scary thing, uh, the, the risk analysis of, of energy efficiency, at least for me, I mean, the, way, the way I'm looking at it. But it's really about compelling uh, motivation. You know, I think that if owners and, and investors looked at this and said, this is a great payback, 
that we wouldn't be having this conversation. So the rewards are, I, I'm going to break down each of these little pieces so that I can sort of start teasing out where these risks are. Okay, so when you look at the rewards for upgrading the property, I broke it down into three things. Basically, the hard stuff, really cost savings. Okay, energy, you know, saving on utility bills, what I call soft qualitative, which is really, it's, it's a combination of risk and reputational, which is a quality adjustment, which is a very fundamental part of every appraisal and every investment. You know, is it high quality or not? You can, you can incorporate that into, into the analysis. And then the health and productivity, which I think is, it gets missed a lot. And it's, it's squishy. I understand why. But basically, th that's the soft. And then what I call the reversion in, in appraisal parlance, that's the, the value at sale. So you've always got this return of, uh, a return on and return of the investment. And when you th whenever I hear the word simple ROI, the first thing I think of is, yeah, but what about when they sell the building? So you, you never can forget that there's two things going on here. Every NOI has a risk attached to it. You know, every return on investment has some future value impact. Um, and so it's complicated, all right? So here's the big question. You know, can you really define this problem? I mean, just realistically. We're all here beating away at this thing, trying to see what the problem is. And I gotta tell you, some problems are just really, really serious. But there are answers. I, I just wanna make, make the point that we're not struggling on something which is insignificant, we're just not paying attention. This is, really is complicated. And it's gotta be a solution. This definition of risk has to be on a large scale. It's gotta be scalable. It's gotta, it's gotta fit into all these seven tribes. It's gotta have a natural flow to the marketplace where the market is the one that's, that's accepting our definition, our analysis of this energy efficiency, and they're the ones that, that, are, that are driving this. We're not, we're not gonna be there. We're just gonna be tagging along. And that, you know, in the, in the world of this, there are lots of influences. I mean, I picked one, utility pricing. You know, this is, what is payback? In, in a market where uh, the average cost of uh, a kilowatt hour is three cents or five cents, really hard. That's really hard. I did, I've done, but I've done properties where I asked that question and they said, oh, it's, he's averaging 22 cents. He's like tier four. He's in demand charges. I'm like, do it today. So you've got these, these other external things that are happening that, uh, that affect all this. So when you look at energy efficiency, this, I broke this down to show you what I see as the different risk tiers, okay? This is like the basic one, you know, the envelope. You're conserving energy, okay? Then you start into, and, and that's, that's, that's pretty dependent on who's in the building, you know, what are they doing in there, the weather, things like that. Then you start looking at upgrades, like you're going to something like a super efficiency, uh, maybe a fuel cell, some, some cogeneration or something. Then what I call energy offsets, where you don't have, there's no expense for generating the energy or the, the benefit that you're doing. It's like solar thermal or, or, or geothermal. And then there's really, you know, energy generation, uh, wind and solar. Now, if you look at the difference between a megawatt, which is this, what this is here, which is, a, a, you know, a watt that doesn't happen, and a megawatt down here, and the risk analysis, very different. Solar panels, the electrons come out of the cable. You can measure them. The utility company will tell you exactly what that price is that minute. Nobody has a question about what happened. You know, if you measure, if you're, you're standing there with a meter, you know exactly what's going on. With megawatts, this is, this is the thing you're looking at. You're finding the value today of a series of future events that do not happen. And if you know about predictions, they're great, except those about the future, okay? I mean, this, this is a serious problem. So looking in the future, and that's where banks look, that's where investors look. I mean, they look in the past too, but you know, it's the, that future stream of benefits and the dependability of that future stream of benefits. There's the amount of it, and then how sure you are that you're actually gonna get it, that really make a difference. And then you've got these goofy things like the weather and these pesky humans who are in these buildings or not in the buildings. I mean, how much energy does an empty building save? How am I gonna cash flow that? You know, a guy lays off half his staff. I mean, there are all kinds of ways that the future value of these energy efficiency upgrades uh, can be in impacted. And with risk, banks, people hate that. 
it's, it's, really, it's really complicated. So this, this idea about proposed construction, you know, you've got a building, you want to renovate it, okay? That's as proposed. That's construction lending. Now, we're, Wells Fargo is a huge construction lending bank. We, we, we have a whole group of people that that's all they do. And it's complicated. But I'll tell you, most of the lending underwriting that we do, the risk analysis that we look at when we make a loan to somebody who's going to build something, is who are you? This is not project financing. The greenest building in the world that walked into a, a Wells Fargo bank with a guy who went BK seven years ago, forget about it, okay? Your Thomas Properties, your Heinz, there's some relationship with the bank, you've got 100 million on deposit, you want to borrow 20 million? Great, here you go. So remember that le banks look at construction lending in a very different way. It's, it's about the future, it's as proposed. It's a complicated appraisal problem, it's expensive, you have, to, you have to people who really understand it to manage it, and all that piles on cost. So when you're looking at a quick and easy solution to as proposed construction lending, you are not going to find it. It just doesn't happen in banking. And, and there's, there's, there are reasons for that. They're called the federal regulators. We are obliged, we are, as a federally you know, you know, insured institution, we are obliged to do prudent lending, which means we have to prove as we went right down the line, we did this, we did this, we did this. We can't just say, hey, those, those windows look great. Here's some money. That's not going to work. So, and because of that complication, it gets expensive. So the, you've got to have all these people right here. This is, this is the tribe right here, okay? An owner, okay, maybe an executive, a C, C, CFO or something. You've got the operations staff in there, the occupants, the tenants. Maybe it's the, uh, the, the owner's uh, you know, company he's got, or, it's, or their tenants. Okay, the agent, the real estate agent, and this is honestly a little side, you want to negotiate a green lease, who's doing it? Two real estate brokers, or agents. What are they worried about? Paying for their bins. They don't care about green. They're just trying to get the deal done. Now when an owner and a, or a buyer and seller are talking mano a mano, you know, directly, okay, but when you get real estate agents and things, suddenly that one step removed, the whole conversation about green gets diluted immediately into things like reserve parking and how, you know, what kind of view, the, how many corner offices have we got and things like that. So these guys are important in the deal. Okay, then these appraisers, like, you know, and then the guys I hire, and the appraisal management firms. I'm the reviewer. I have to read this thing. I have to understand it. I've got to believe it. It's got to be credible, worthy of belief. That's a key word. So it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be credible. And so then you get into these guys, the chief credit officer, the loan underwriters. They've got to believe it. They've got to understand it. So when you're trying to convince a bank that they should lend you money to do a project, any project, these are the people, whoops, sorry about that. These are the guys that all have to be convinced. And if any one of them does isn't, you're over. It's over. Okay, I haven't gotten to the hard part yet. Okay. All right, so, so when you go to uh, propose construction, all right, you've got this very quickly, you've got the ID in the shower, you've got ink on paper, you've got entitlements. That's kind of where an appraisal might show up, like an as-is value. You know, then you've got vertical construction, then you've got stabilized occupancy. This is maybe for new construction, but it would work for, uh, for uh, upgrades to a building. And then you have stabilized history. This is where I like to live. This is what investors like. They like, show me three years of operating statements. That's what I call dependability. When it's as proposed, it's up here someplace, you're just finished, you, 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 I think it's gonna be leased in a year, yeah. I hope, you know? And those are the kind of doubts that make bankers, investors very nervous, okay? And you have gotta deal with all these when you're making a proposal for an energy upgrade. Okay, so, but, but believe me, there, there, are, there are solutions, and I'm gonna to start to get into this. One of the key things about the appraisal process and lending is the, uh, the, um, the experts. You know, there are problems that have been solved before, you know, when there are hazardous materials, uh, contaminated soils, before the phase one report, you know, they, they still did loans. They were just really expensive and really complicated. But they standardized that sort of process. They standardized the appraisal process after the SNL crisis. And all these experts, this, this, this use of third party expert reports is a key component of standard real estate lending. 
and loan underwriting. And it's not just the expert opinion that they give you, it's the transfer of risk. When you hire a guy who does a phase one report for you, or you get an engineer who does a property condition assessment, which is done on every Fannie or Freddie deal I do, that, that transfer of risk, the appraiser isn't responsible suddenly for, for measuring the building. He isn't responsible for determining, oh, I need a new roof in three years, or wow, that foundation is really bad and this is what it's gonna cost. That transfer has been, has been taken over by this third party. And so the lead-in, of course, is that there's gonna be third party experts doing that job here. It is not gonna be the appraiser, it is not gonna be the banker, it is not gonna be you guys, it's gonna be an expert who's brought in, who understands, and, and we're developing a lot of those standards right now. Uh, let me see my standards. So, uh, yeah, all right. So all right, just a quick couple of comments about the appraisal process. Uh, you know, market value has three approaches. Very standard stuff. Sales comparison, what sold ne next door yesterday just like me. Income, NOI, adjusted for the, the risk, and the cost approach, which is mostly applicable for new construction. Okay, some tribes rely on one or the other. Lots of, you get a residential appraisal, it's gonna look at sales comps, what's sold in the area, with adjustments for all kinds of things. If you look at big investment property, it's all gonna be about income. That's it. And some of them are you know, kind of a mix. And, and every appraisal, in, in a sense, looks at all three of those. And they're trying to mimic the be behavior of the marketplace. Okay, I mentioned about simple payback and, and, uh, and an ROI, that you've gotta include that, that sale at the end of it. Um, the, the definition of market value includes this statement. Parties are well informed or well advised. So whenever you hear someone say, well, these appraisers, they don't understand anything. Well, that's okay. Just give me an energy audit. Give me, give me a good, good financial analysis. Hire somebody to do that. And then the appraiser will take that and he'll just look at it and go, I'm relying on this guy. So these are here, the HERS reports for homes, ASHRAE standards, ComNet, BIPA, I mean, there's, a, there's an alphabet soup of these things happening right now, and that is gonna coalesce, that will at some point. I've got a, I've got a if anybody's up late at night and can't sleep, you can go to my LinkedIn page. I've got a th whole thing I gave it to Lane about uh, something called the resource appraisal, which is basically my idealized future vision of how this energy report would tie into building systems and things like that. But, but it's, gonna, it's gonna show up, and appraisers are gonna take that the way they take a phase one and, and deal with it. Uh, and, and there are other things that are also, just as a side note, the residential appraisal world is in turmoil. Uh, if you know any residential appraisals, they would, appraisers there tell you, the, you know, after the last debacle, uh, they, they started this appraisal management company structure sort of in between banks and appraisers. Uh, it's really affected their fee structure. I think in California, a third of the really seasoned residential appraisers were leaving the business. You know, these are not the kind of things that help us when the most seasoned, experienced guys who can really understand the kind of sophisticated dialogue we're trying to have with them, and the guys we're talking to are from you know, 100 miles away, and they're you know, three months into the business. So there are realities beyond us. So okay, so I looked at these tribes. I looked at the as-proposed process and all the different kind of levels. I looked at the tiers of, of, of upgrades that you could do from just windows and doors all the way to to solar PV, and then I looked at the eight, these tribes and the types of influences in the tribes that would affect them that are different, okay? So there are eight of them. There may be more, but these are the eight I picked out. Okay, so things like a holding period. So if you've got somebody who holds their, holds their building for a long time, like a mush market, courthouse, school, j jail, 10-year payback, hey, no problem. You've got a middle market read guy, a real estate person. He's a buy, reposition, and sell, three, five-year hold. Ooh, wow, that's, that's gonna be kind of scary. Okay, homeowners, you know, they say five to seven years, but you know, some markets are longer. I mean, so the holding period affects the, the attitude of risk with an energy efficient uh, upgrade. Uh, access to, uh, the, uh, the, 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 having cash, I mean, REITs. I mean, are these guys loaded now or what? I mean, they have had a run up in, in capitalization that is insane. Okay, compare them to the SBA crowd. They, I mean, these guys have no money. And if they do, they're, they're pumping it back into their business. So you look at that kind of influence on risk. Like what, what do they have in their pocket to really invest? Uh, access to debt. 
Uh, some banks, like you know, the big guys, the big commercial guys that we deal with, hey, you got 100 million on deposit, we'll lend you 50. That's the way banks work. So you know, if you don't have any, any access to debt, like small SBA types, you know, a homeowner with a 650 FICO, uh, you got a problem. You got a problem. And that problem can be solved in SBA, a very elegant and well-seasoned example of poor credit with a credit-enhanced vehicle. Banks love SBA lending. Wells Fargo is one of the largest, if not the largest, SBA lender in the United States. And, and it's, and it's, and it's credit-enhancement. So we take that debt. Our, our loss uh, is at 50% of the loan amount, and everything above that SBA covers. OK, the split incentive, really thorny problem. This is a tough one, and it moves around a lot. Uh, investment sophistication. If you show somebody a discounted cash flow, Big commercial investment guys, it's bear rabbit in the briar patch. Great. Homeowners, you lost them. Uh, the, the pricing, local pricing, some, play, some price that, that seven cent a kilowatt hour versus 22 cents, local uh, utility uh, kind of uh, incentives vary a lot. Just the general risk appetite, just how culturally you know, oriented are these entrepreneurs or are they you know, grab and hold types? Um, and then just each location has a kind of sophistication about its own, you know, just the green effect. Are there Priuses in the neighborhood, or is everybody driving Hummers? And that has a big effect on the appraised value. So very quick recap, we've got the seven tribes. You get the three value, the, the hard, soft, and the reversion, the upgrades, the six years of all the different ladders of risk between the ID and the shower. You've got the 12 people in the mortgage chain. You've got the eight different tiers of things. <laughs> I mean, is this scary? Is this sc I'm scared. So what is, it's, it's this, you cannot come up with one solution. You've got to drill down and find out what it works. So this is the grid that I've set up. There will not be a quiz on this later, okay? But this is, these are the tribes up here, okay? Mush, homes, these are the different hurdles. And then what I did is I just tried to stick in here, you know, where, you know, what, what is that exactly going on? You know, some of these are really good, some of them are not. Um, you can, I've got a spreadsheet, I've got it in Excel if you want to you know, play with it, but I've applied this kind of idea at my job, really, a couple of times. I, had a, I was on a conference call with uh, four merchant builders who were steaming mad about some bad appraisers, appraisals they were getting, and uh, you know, I, it all came down to how the appraisal was ordered by the bank. So the appraisal management company got the order, they gave it to the appraiser, the appraiser went out to the new home, the guy at the, the developer handed him the HERS report, and the, and the appraiser said, what's this? What, what, what is this? Uh, that was it. So you had to go all the way back to the, when the, was, the appraisal was ordered and say, well, you have to get somebody out there who understands an income approach, who has got a scope of work that, that says, you must include in your report comments about this. And if you are not competent to do that, you have, to do, you have to decline the assignment. You can become competent, which is not that hard if you just rely on this. I say, hey, I relied on this guy's report. Looks good. I'll buy it. So you can do that. But you can't take the assignment on if you're not competent. So once we figured that out, suddenly we could make the change. In our, we could send guys out there who do like two to three units. And they, knew, they know income approach. And when they said that, I said, well, they said, well we, the, most of the residential guys who go out there, they don't do income approach. I said, well, you do two to, th two to four units. Oh, yeah, but that's a different panel of appraisers. Oh, so maybe they're the ones who should be getting this work. Oh, yeah, but they're more expensive. Oh, Mr. Developer, will you pay a little extra for an appraisal that's actually accurate? Yeah, sure. And there you go. So it does work. Okay, uh, this uh, Los Angeles PACE program, same kind of thing. They wanted to do really big loans. We tried to pitch the big CNI guys, and they said, hey, we're not salespeople, we're, we're relationship managers. You know, we don't pitch these people. They come to us, and we, we help them. Okay, then we went way down low, under $500,000. They said, oh, this is too complicated. And, and all the PACE guys uh, who are running the program said, we can't, we can't do a deal at $500,000, that's way too low. So where do we end up? the middle market. That's where the sweet spot was. So that's where you zeroed in. Okay, uh, just to mention UC Davis, they've got a great program going right now that's focused very specifically on small 
multi-tenant properties, basically strip centers, small commercial properties. Really huge, huge market, very thorny problem, but they're focused, and that's how you get this stuff done. Okay, so here's the hook. This is the, this is the zinger slide, okay? So after all this complicated stuff, okay, I'm gonna pitch, I'm gonna throw out there this crazy idea, and Thede, you know, you can jump in on this. The cost approach, it's an elegant thing. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, and it really happens best right when improvements are new. So the riskiest part for a bank is when, if you go back to that slide, the idea in the shower and all that, is when you don't have a stabilized property. It's three years, basically that's the hot spot. So if you look at the cost approach, and you say, okay, I spent $50,000, $100,000 upgrading this building, what's the value? I get, I'm getting on the hook here. How many people here have ever heard of the cost versus value study from Remodeling Magazine? <laughs> this is a great thing. This is a wonderful thing. Okay, and here's what it looks like. Okay, 10 years, well, they've got nine years here. They're basically tracking 35 different renovation projects 88 markets, nine regions, extremely robust statistical modeling, tile bathrooms, upgraded roofs, new windows, doors. They don't have a breakout for energy efficiency, but I've been pounding on them for a couple of years to do that. And they all end up right around here, okay? This, this curve right here, okay? That is where you end up, 50 cents in the dollar. 50 cents in the dollar. That is where you can go as a bottom tier if you just use the cost approach. So you wanna, you wanna put 100 grand into your building, I can do a deal like that, 50,000 bucks on the value. HUD and, Fann and Fannie, actually, they give you the full value. If you look at the standards for home and uh, uh, energy efficient mortgages, they will actually go dollar for dollar with you. They'll go dollar for dollar on a solar upgrade with a couple of caveats. So the cost approach is fast, it's old, it's been around. This is a, a report uh, back in 1999 that used the, the, this study from Remodeling Magazine back then to show that energy efficiency upgrades have market value with a window upgrade. So this is nothing new, okay? And there's one little magic thing here, and this is for, for the behavioralists. Phoenix tanked, okay, in the last crash, okay? And I was watching very carefully because I, I was trying to test a 60% replacement value rule. I went through the, the 90s crash in LA, and I remember some guys saying, we're buying apartments in Orange County now. And I was like, why? He goes, oh, they hit 60% of replacement. That's when you jump in. So there's some behavioral switch at 50 cents, 60%, something like that, where risk, you lose that, am I gonna be losing money, or I gotta get in now because the train's leaving the station. And, there's, and that's a question I don't have an answer for but I'm gonna leave you guys with that. All right, thank you very much.